our Saviour, our brother and friend. Amen. Okay, now we're reading from Genesis chapter 38 tonight. This has never been part of the scripture curriculum. (laughs) If you're not familiar with it, you'll see why when we read it. Okay, so we start off, um, we hear about Judah. He's one of Jacob's 12 sons. So Genesis chapter 38. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kezib that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Sleep with your brother's wife and fulfil your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his, So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from from providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, he may die too, just like his brother's. So Tamar went to live in her father's household. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah to the men who were shearing his sheep, and his friend Hira the Adalamite went with him. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that, though Sheila had now grown up, she had not been given to him as as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realising that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, "'Come now.' Let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? He said. She asked, sorry. He said, what pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her. And she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judas sent the young goat by his friend the Adamalite in order to get his pledge back from the woman. But he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, Where is the shrine prostitute who was beside the road at Enaim? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said, there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah said, let her keep what she has or we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you didn't find her. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognise whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognised them and said, she is more righteous than I since I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila. And 
he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. So the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it to his wrist and said, This one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out. And she said, So this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out. And he was named Zerah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see that we're all awake now. Not that we needed that. How did this mess happen? It was the good old days. Well, probably not that. It was lockdown, COVID lockdown 2020. And my dear wife was at home, homeschooling two children. And I had a then three-year-old son, Micah. And I was uh, up at church at work. And I get a phone call. I need you to come home. And I come home and I see, as I walk closer... Micah, my youngest, had uh, been entertaining himself. While the other two were being educated, he had found the green paint. Uh, and I love that there's, there's some just... Uh, this one in particular, I love this photo. It's like a horror movie, isn't it? It's the hand sliding down the wall. But then he's trying to clean it. Uh, trying as best as he could to fix this mess. But, you know, look at this face. How could you not just love and forgive him and spend hours upon hours trying to get green paint out of that lounge? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt caught in sin? You're you're caught trying to, to fix this problem, but you're just making it worse and you're just spreading more and more problems as you go. And as people find out about your sin, you have these waves and waves of guilt and shame pouring over you. Sin causes mess in our lives. We can often try and hide it, deceive others, pretend everything is fine, and have about as much luck as my three-year-old son Micah did. Today, as we see this story of Judah, we will see a mess. We will see a big family mess. Uh, Over the course of this series, we've seen Abraham called from his family to go into the promised land. God promised that he would have many children. After 25 years, he had Isaac. Isaac, not a great character. Genesis doesn't spend a whole lot of time on him, but he has Jacob. And Jacob, we've seen last week that Jacob stole, deceived to get the blessing from God. Jacob goes off and has children. Uh, He marries two women, Leah and Rachel, and he has children with them. And Jacob, unfortunately, plays favorites with his children. And Judah is one of the sons of Leah. Leah is his first wife, his least favorite wife. And so Judah comes along and we see the story of Judah here in chapter 38. In chapter 37, the last chapter which we're actually going to see next week, Joseph, the favorite of the family, was sold into slavery. But as we see this messy story of Judah and his family, the challenge will be to consider our own lives, our own mess, our own sin. Not so that we would crumple in shame, but to know how much God loves us despite us. Let me pray as we have a look at Genesis 38. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gross and seedy story from your word. But Lord, it reminds us that the Bible is about real people, real people just like us. Father, help us to know who we are and to know how great you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
we're going to start this evening with Judah in Canaan. We're going to, to see the impact of living in Canaan. Uh, from uh, chapter 38, verse 1. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her, made love to her, she, he, and had two sons, Ur and Onan, and then he had a third son, Shalah. Okay, now this seems all fine and normal. A man finds a woman, marries, and has three kids. It's pretty much my story. What, what's, so, what's so different about this story? Well, Judah has left his family, he's left his brother's household, and he's living amongst the people of Canaan, Canaanite people. This is the people who God is going to get rid of in the promised land that God is sending people to. Uh, previously in chapter 28, Judah's father, Jacob, was told not to marry people that were Canaanites. And instead, he goes off and marries Leah and Rachel. But we know that Jacob, just like his father Isaac, played favorites. Jacob's brother Esau, who he'd stolen the birthright from, uh, he himself went and married a Canaanite to spite his dad. And now Judah, Jacob's son, likely unloved by his dad, not the favorite, Maybe Judah is doing the same thing, going off to marry a Canaanite to spite his dad. And we can expect that these people, and that the Canaanites, the way they live with their disregard of God, is going to cause problems for Judah. As Proverbs says, the one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Or, as I saw this quote from motivational speaker Jim Rohn, who I've never thought, heard of, but I like this quote, you are the average of the top five people you spend the most time with. So who are the top five people you spend most time with? For Judah, he left his family who was seeking to follow God, and he is spending time with the Canaanites who are disregarding God. It is no wonder that there are many problems. And so we see these problems come with his sons. Uh, Judah gets a wife for Ur, his firstborn, uh, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, that's the second son, sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as brother-in-law to raise up offspring. This is a uh, a, a, a Levite, a tradition amongst the Jews that they would do this. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from having his brother's kids. Again, this is a really gross part of the Bible. But Judah's sons had become like the people around them. Sinful, despicable, will, uh, wicked to God. Uh, we don't know the details of Ur's sin, but it was clearly terrible enough that the Lord did not let him die at a good old age, but caused him to die early. Onan, as we've seen, has the responsibility of continuing the family line, having children for his brother. But he has no interest in that. Uh, he has no objection to having sex with his brother's wife. He's got no objection to that chasing pleasure with Tamar, but he does not take on the responsibility. And so God sees Onan's practice deliberately using Tamar for his own pleasure as a heinous sin and puts him to death. The same custom that meant Onan, the second brother, was responsible for Tamar and children, meant that Judah, the dad, should give him to the youngest son, Shelah. Verse 11 Judah said to his daughter-in-law, go back to your dad's house. Go live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shalak grows up. For he thought he, might die, he may die too, just like his brothers. It appears that Judah is superstitious, blaming Tamar for the death of the two older sons. And so he's worried that his youngest, his only son left, would die too. But Shalak's not old enough, so conveniently... 
Judah is able to hide away his problems. He's able to hide away Tamar to hopefully have Shalah marry someone else in the future. Uh, we see the story then turn to Judah and Tamar. After a long period of time passes, Judah's wife dies. And he goes to, hear, to, to shear his sheep, as was his custom. And Tamar hears about it and quickly responds in verse 14. She takes off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and sat down at the entrance to Enaim. For she saw that, though Shelha had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. Tamar had been deceived, she'd been abused, she'd been let down by Onan and by Judah, and she desires to get what she is owed, children. And she disguises herself to trick Judah to do it. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he's grieving, his wife has just died. He thought she was a prostitute, for he, she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her and said, let me sleep with you. What will, give, what will you give me to sleep with you? I'll send you a young goat from my flock. Well, what will you give me as a pledge until you give it to me? Uh, how about my seal and its cord and the staff in your hand? Two things happen here. Judah, grieving after his wife's death, is seeking pleasure. And Tamar is seeking what she is owed. Now, this is an incredible, da incredibly dangerous gambit for Tamar to be playing, risking her life. And she winds up with a far greater advantage than she realized. Uh, in, in negotiating her, her fee here, because he doesn't have the flock of sheep with him, he, she ends up getting his, what is it, this, your cord and your seal and the staff in your hand. Now, does anybody have a family seal? Does anybody sign, send letters with their wax seal? Anybody? It sounds like something out of Game of Thrones, doesn't it? It, it sounds kind of wonderful. Now, I, I think the closest thing that we would have is if you took out your phone and you unlocked it and then you gave it to somebody else and said, you can have everything on me. That phone has got all the record about me. And Judah, well, he sleeps with her and then goes to his sheep and he tries to send one of his goats as payment to get his seal and his cord and his staff back, proof of who he was. But they can't find this prostitute. And I can't help but think of Judah finding out about this news. You know, living for months thinking that someone else has got this control over him. Some woman he, he didn't know could blackmail him without warning. Walking every step, every day with this constant dread that someone was just going to pop up and his sexual sin was going to become known by everyone. Maybe they'll find out. Maybe everyone will know what I did just after my wife died. Imagine if they knew my search history. Imagine if they knew what I was really like. How would people look at me? Verse 24, about three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution. And as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and have her burnt to death. Judah knows that Tamar is technically engaged to the youngest, Shalah, but condemns her to the worst kind of death. What, what horrible hypocrisy. And Tamar just quietly points out, I am pregnant by the man who owns this. See, see if you recognize, I just, this, this blackmail is, the, the language is, is, is so strong. See if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff Judah, uh, then Judah responds, Judah sees these and says, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Shalah. And he did not sleep with her again. Uh, Judah, who should have given Tamar to his son, he, he takes on the responsibility as the one to continue the family line 
which should have been Shelah. Judah, uh, sorry, Tamar has deceived Judah to get what she was owed. But Judah's sin is worse. Judah sees uh, that she is more righteous than I. They have both been horrible. Everyone in this story is terrible. But Judah, at this point, is confronted by his own sin. He's been caught in it, and he's confronted. And it seems to be a turning point for him. When we first meet Judah in chapter 37, which we're actually going to see next week, he sells his brother off into slavery. This Judah is not a particularly great character. But after this, in chapter 44, Judah is willing to sell himself into slavery to save his brother's life. In between these two points, we see this journey that Judah went on. His sin, his sexual depravity, and how God humbled him. God has humbled him and changed his heart. In Tamar's pregnancy, well, she gives birth to two boys. Uh, One of them is called Perez. And it, it is in this line of Judah, by Tamar's son Perez, we actually get to Jesus. Tamar is one of four Gentile women, four women outside of Israel, non-Jewish women in the family history of Jesus. And I love that God uses her, even though she is sinful, even though she is weak in this story, even though she is passed around, used and unloved, and she ultimately blackmails Judah to get what she wants, God still loves her, and God chooses to use both Judah and Tamar, despite who they both are. Brothers and sisters, Genesis 38 here, it gives hope to sinners, to people like you and to people like me. Because Jesus didn't come to save good people, but hopeless sinners. Are we in a mess? Is sin barricading us away from our relationship with Christ? We can come back to Him. We can seek His forgiveness. Because everything required for forgiveness has already happened in Jesus. God can change this ugliness and transform it to joy. And this story in Genesis 38, this this story which is probably over 30 odd years, it's a long story of sin and pain and depravity. And whether we've been stuck in sin for years and years, God still loves you and He calls you out of it. Because none of us are too far gone for redemption. But we need to be awakened to the reality of evil in our lives. Uh, As we've read this, I'm I'm sure that this has brought to mind your own sin. Whether that's how you have used other people, whether it's how you've deceived and tricked others, or your own sexual sin and depravity. Just like Judah is confronted with his sin, we need to take a good hard look at ourselves. And we shouldn't just brush it off. Oh, it's not that bad. I can hide it. I can try and cover up my sin like Judah did by playing off, paying off his pleasure with a goat. No, we, we need to be convicted of how sinful we are. Our sin that is so bad that God had to die. Let me ask you, if, you're, if your life was recorded in a book of the Bible... Let, let's say, uh, I'm going to call Mike. Mike's, Mike's going to be the 14th apostle. This doesn't happen anymore. But let's just say Mike was the 14th apostle, and he was writing the, the most recent uh, book of the Bible, and he was writing it about your life. What would you not want him to record in that? What, what parts of our life do we not want people to know about? Because in this story of Judah, we get to know the grossest details. You only need to look at Onan and what he does with his sister-in-law. What what are the parts of our lives that we really don't want anyone to know? We can respond by thinking, do you know what? Yeah, 
but we all have problems. Do you know what? Actually, today's a new day. Today's the 9th of June. That's a good... Sure, it's not January 1st, but I'm going to try much harder. I'm going to pull up my socks. I'm never going on the internet again. Uh, I'm going to speak lovingly tomorrow. It, it, tomorrow's a new day. I'm going to be a new person. Problem solved. But the hard, painful truth is, brothers and sisters, that shame does not motivate us to follow Jesus. We don't look at our sin and think, oh, I'm the worst, I've got to do better. It doesn't work. That is why Jesus is so great. He, he never comes to me, he never comes to us and says, you need to have everything sorted out. You, you need to actually be trying harder for me to love you. You, I'm not going to die for you. you. You don't deserve it. He has never said that. He said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I don't know about you, but I am so weary and I am so burdened by my sin. Don't you wish it was gone? We get to bring it to Jesus. And he doesn't do what, what Judah wanted to do to Tamar. Jesus doesn't say to us, I'm going to burn you for your sin. He said, I'm going to die on the cross for your sin. He says, I've forgiven you. I've loved you so much that your sin has been dealt with. Isn't that the best news ever? The debt has been paid. Our shame has been dealt with. We are dearly loved. None of us are too far gone for redemption. So brothers and sisters, we'll head out tonight. I don't know, some of us might go to dinner. We might go home. We might click through Instagram. Uh, at some point in the next hour, in the next day, in the next week, we will be confronted by our own sin. We will find ourselves full of shame. We will find ourselves stuck. Don't hide from it. Do what Judah did, finally, after all those years. Be confronted by it. Don't try and bribe your way out of it. Don't try and run and hide from it. Instead, look to the cross. Look to what Jesus has done, that he has dealt with our sin and that he joyfully says, come and bring it to me because I have died so you can be forgiven and clean and right. And then we can rejoice. And we're going to do that in a second when we're going to sing. Band's going to come up right now. I'm going to pray so that we would sing and we would rejoice joyfully because it is dealt with in Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so good to us, that you love us, that you have not left us in our mess. And Lord, you know you know the mess of our lives. Lord, you know the hidden mess. You know the things that we don't even want to admit to ourselves. But Lord, you are so good. You have paid every price so that we could know you, so that we could be forgiven, so that we can stand before you and be loved. Heavenly Father, help us to be people who don't try and run and hide, but instead get to rejoice, for you are so great.